for us today. I've got a room full here at Velma Jackson High School. We're also recording this for our friends at Germantown High School and Original High School. D-Cell from uh, Germantown is actually joining us right now as well. Um, wow. So th this is our all of our entrepreneurship classes we have for Madison County Schools. Um, and we've, we've looked at your website, talked a little bit about your company. Uh, we got some amazing questions we're going to get to from them. <laughs> uh, you, uh, first of all, I mean, and again, I know you're super busy. We see you on the news all the time doing some great things for the city of Jackson. But uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about Salamukis, Broad Street, and Bravo, what all you guys got going on, how you started? Well, thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. So hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jeff Good, and I am the co-owner of Bravo Italian Restaurant located in Highland Village. Broad Street Baking Company, uh, located in uh, Banner Hall, which is I-55 and Northside Drive, right across the interstate from Bravo. And then also Salamuki's New York Pizza and Ice Cream Joint, which uh, was started in the Fondren neighborhood on Taylor Street next to the JSU Stadium um, 14 and a half years ago. But this year we moved the original location uh, to the district at Eastover. So right there between Lakeland and Meadowbrook on I-55 um, uh, North. And then we also have a franchise location of Salamukis that many of you will be familiar with. It's located in Colony Crossing there at Bozeman Road and 463, and that's the Salamukis Madison. And that is owned by a, uh, a couple, uh, not by my partner and I, but that's owned by Patrick Munn and Hallie Sappington. And those two young folks were two great managers of ours for a number of years, and they showed the desire to have their own restaurant. So we worked together to create that opportunity to make, uh, make that place happen for them. Um, we have been in the restaurant business for 27 and a half years. Uh, my business partner and I opened Bravo April 7 of 1994. Uh, he and I were um, friends at Murrah High School. Uh, we met when I moved here from Salt Lake City, Utah in 1980. That's how old I am. Um, uh, we, I moved here, did my senior year of high school at Murrah, and that's where I met Dan. He and I became good friends. We stayed in contact uh, through college. I went to Millsaps. He went to University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, Dan was planning on being a lawyer, uh, graduated with an economics degree, uh, moved to San Francisco, started working in a law firm, uh, uh, studying for his LSAT, um, and uh, decided after three or four months of doing that, he hated it. Came home, told his parents that he wanted to go to culinary school, went back out to San Francisco after the holidays and enrolled at California Culinary Academy, became a chef and started cooking in the Bay Area. I graduated from Millsaps College, got a job in the computer industry, selling large computer systems. I did that for a number of years until 1992, when my company was purchased by another company. And the um, uh, edict came down after about a year that they were going to close my division and close the Jackson office. So I was going to lose my job. Um, I tried to find another job at that point in time, um, while still working the wrap up at, at the, that, the, the company I was at. Uh, couldn't find anything that really uh, fit me or that they wanted me or I wanted them. And one night I called Dan on the phone and said, you know, I'm really getting scared here I'm, that we're going to be shutting down pretty soon. I don't have a job. I don't know what I'm going to do. And Dan uh, likewise said, uh, I'm here in San Francisco. I'm working in the fourth restaurant since graduating culinary school. I'm not very happy here. I'm not sure what I want to do. We were both uh, at that point, late 20s, so maybe, you know, 28, 29. Um, We'd had, you know, a number of years of work history um, and um, both had college business degrees. And we decided that we should think about going into business together. But I was just a salesman. I didn't have any skills. Dan was a chef. Um, now, I worked since I've been 13 as a janitor then in food service. So I waited tables all the way through college. So I was no um, stranger to restaurants, but I'd never managed or, or, or ran one. But um, he and I started working on a business plan with his young, younger brother, and we uh, came up with the idea for Bravo. And we, um, we wrote a business plan that many of you would be very impressed with. It must have been 50, 60 pages, pretty detailed. Um, I took that and met with a banker friend of mine who was a loan officer and told him all about the um, great restaurant, Bravo. We're going to open this amazing Italian restaurant. It's going to be the best in the city. Everybody's going to love it. It's going to be the best food. Best, best, best. We need a half a million dollars. How do we borrow a half a million dollars? And he looked at me and he said, you know, um, <clears throat> we're not going to loan you a half a million dollars. We're not going to loan you anything. You know, that's the riskiest business in the world. There is no way that you're going to get a loan unless you have a half a million dollars in the bank. If you have a half a million dollars on deposit, we'll loan you a half a million dollars. 
So, you know, we didn't have any money and we didn't have any, any um, family money like that to be able to pull something off. So um, most people, and I, I, the reason I'm telling this story, because this is the you know, entrepreneurship track, um, most people, when they're faced, when they, when they do the work, and we did a good bit of work to write that business plan, and it was a, you know, a lot of effort. Um, and then we presented it to the power structure, which is a bank, right? That's where you get money from. And we were told, no, clearly, no. Most people would stop at that point. They wouldn't move forward. Um, one of my um, personality traits is I have a lot of grit. I'm, I'm not afraid to keep on trying, keep on going. So um, what I did is I, I fell back and I networked. I talked to um, business people that had various types of businesses, real estate deals, you know, oil wells, um, um, people that had put together partnerships, raised money. And I asked them how they did that. And they shared, they shared with me the model for uh, selling shares of stock to be able to start a business. And so I met um, with a lawyer and, a, and an accountant and we, um, you know, Dan and, and David and I, we put together a larger business plan. It turned out to be 250 pages long and uh, it took us quite some time to finish that. A lot of legal work with the, with the accounting team, with the legal team, an awful lot of accounting documents, five years with the financials that to the, you know, spoon, knife and fork, you know, budgeted the business, came up with a final budget of $450,000. We filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission as a private placement, and then we went to sale. So in order to sell um, an investment, you have, to, you have to follow certain laws to follow what's called blue sky laws. There are certain rules before you can start soliciting money uh, that you have a prospectus that has certain language in it. So you explain all the risks of the business. So our business plan, you know, big 250 pages, nice cover. You'd open it up and have a cover page. The second page was risks. And it pretty much said the following for four pages. These guys have never owned a restaurant. They know nothing about it. They've never run a business. They don't know how to run a business. They don't have any money. They're raising money. This is the riskiest business in the world. Most restaurants fail, yada, 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 yada. And then after you get through all the risks, you have the table of contents. And then the first page is, hello, let me tell you about Bravo. And then it goes into sales. You, know, you tell the story. I um, prospected, that's a sales term, meaning I contacted to talk to 750 people, either face-to-face -face or on the telephone. I fed 250 people in my house. My wife and I had a small house in Bellhaven, and we did these little dinner parties of eight to 10 people. You know, so I'd be working the phones, talking to people. Can you make this next Tuesday? You can. Okay, let me call this guy. You can make Thursday. Okay, wait a minute. Tuesday, Thursday. I keep on working until we could get eight or 10 people on one date and we'd set a dinner party. Um, Dan was still in San Francisco working at this point. He was going to come home when uh, this got closer to reality. His younger brother, David, was here. Thank God, because David was a very talented cook. I am all thumbs in the kitchen. So David was able to produce great food every night that we would be representative of our product. So one of the things about, about marketing and entrepreneurship is if you have an idea, being able to show somebody what the idea is. So if you're writing a piece of software, you need to be able to show a beta version of it. If you're opening a restaurant, food, you know, this is what we're going to do. So we would, we would offer a buffet of food, some wine, talk around the table, then sit down in the living room and we would present the business plan. So 750 people talked to, 250 people came through my door, and uh, 44 people invested $10,000 a piece. Wow. So I had, um, out of 750 people asked, only 44 people said yes. That means 716 people, 706 people said, oh, hell no. Um, so I, you know, a lot of rejection, you know, that's one of the things you have to do when you're starting an idea is you have to be willing to take no and keep on going. Um, and I kept on going. It took a year and a half uh, from the time we, um, you know, started talking about this business idea to the time we got the last, the last share. And um, once we had all the money, uh, we started construction and we did a lot of that construction ourselves. We worked with contractors, but at night when the contractors weren't around, we did a lot of the work um, because we wanted to keep the price down, keep it going. And we finally were able to open it to, um, in, um, uh, as I said, April 7 of 94. Um, so roughly, you know, from original idea to opening the restaurant over two years, um, after four to four and a half years of, of 
running Bravo, which was the hardest work of my life every day, eight in the morning until two in the morning, six days a week, every single day, every single day on Mondays when we were closed, I worked nine to five. There was no personal life. I was married. Uh, some, at some point in time, somehow we had children. I don't know how that happened. But um, uh, we decided to open a second restaurant and that was Broad Street Baking Company. And we did a similar format. We went straight to the plan to make a, an investment vehicle. We, we sold 80 $15,000 shares, $1.2 million to open Broad Street and Banner Hall by one third of Banner Hall. So our business is co-owners of the building um, and to make that bakery happen. Um, we had one meeting, uh, a big a presentation down at the old Capitol Inn in the ballroom. I had about 250 people in the audience. We made one presentation. And then in uh, 20 days, we sold uh, the, the uh, 80 shares of, of, uh, of stock. Uh, the difference there is the first time around, um, Greg, we were unknown. Doing the second time around, we were well known and successful. And everyone knew that we fulfilled our financial commitments. And so they wanted to be a part of it. Um, after running Broad Street for a number of years, we decided to do one more concept, which was Salamuki's New York pizza and ice cream joint. I had twin girls, you know, dads take girls out for ice cream and kids out for ice cream. And there wasn't many places to have ice cream in Jackson. I told Dan, I want to do an ice cream place. He does not have children. He had no interest in ice cream, but he wanted to do a pizzeria. So we put the two ideas together. We compromised. We right. came up with this great idea. And this time we did go to the bank. And because we had a track record, we didn't have the money in the bank that we needed to you know, remodel the building. So it wasn't one of those things where they said, we'll give you this if you have it in. But we had a track record. We had a business with years of financial uh, records. We had a name for ourselves. So the bank was willing to take a, a risk with us with the loan. And, uh, and we started Salamukis. So that is my entrepreneurial story in 10 minutes. I don't want to, I don't want to give a speech, but I wanted to give you guys some context as to how Dan and I got started. And uh, from there, I'd be glad to answer any and all questions. Well, and I have some before I get to their questions. But um, sure. first of all, it's really cool. You said some of the same things that, that I've talked about because you said, and I, I had no idea that's how Salamookies was born. It's because you wanted a place to take your daughters for ice cream. And, they're, and you're right. They're in the Jackson area. There really is no uh, place dedicated to that. So it's about. They had the, they had the uh, Marble Slab on County Line. There was the Baskin Robbins that was in front of Kroger on I-55. And the people that owned that were incredibly mean. It was not but, fun to go there. Yeah, no, and, no atmosphere. And yeah. you got a yogurt place. And that was it. Yeah, the, the yogurt place in Highland Village. Yeah, and, and all and all of those are, are, are corporate chain places. There, there wasn't the local yep. place that you talked about. Yep. So one thing that we talked about, you know, even on the on the novice level in high school is it's all about finding something that people want, all about finding something that people will pay for. Yes. Um, yeah, it needs to be cool to you. But again, at the end of the day, you have to have something that people are willing to um, buy and people are willing to buy into. Because, you know, I, I'm obviously a novice, but I also always say um, if people will buy it, why not sell it? And if people will pay it, why not charge it? So if those two things can be answered and you have the need for it, I think you can come up with an extremely successful business. And I think that's cool that uh, you had that idea. Um, and the other thing you talked about that we're also talking about is you talked about your business plan. Now, we're not going to have time in the school year to do the whole 250 page business plan, but we have done the mission and vision statements. We're working on the executive summary now. So how important is that to get into detail when they're pitching a business in order to get invested? So I want you guys to think about if somebody was to come to you and ask you for money. And what would it take for you to trust that person, especially if they're talking about something that doesn't exist? Okay. It's one thing to say, hey, um, let's buy this car together and you'll use it on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And I'll use it on Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, and you'll leave it alone on Sunday and we'll share it. It's tangible. You know what the deal is, blah, blah, blah. But a business is, hey, give me your money. So I can create this business that I think is going to be successful and I'm going to have to work really hard at, and you need to trust me and I know what I'm doing. So how do you, how do you show, especially if this is your first time, how do you show competence? Well, the business plan does because it's a litmus test, meaning it is a, it is, it is proof that you have thought fully about your idea. You are able to, to, articulate it by putting it on paper. Um, it's a test of your writing and logic skills because the way you present it, the way you, you write, the way you reason is going to speak to your intelligence. Um, 
That doesn't mean you need to be Einstein, but it just speaks to you know how you think, how you present the idea. And it also um, lets the reader um, digest the idea and ask themselves, have they thought about all of the possible positives and negatives? Have they thought about all the outcomes? I have a lot of folks that come to me and want to talk about business ideas and, and you know, they know how we did this and they, they, their idea of a business plan is something they've written in, they've written one page on a three wing binder and they've, it's been in pencil and they've erased some things. It's really quite stunning. And they say, well, won't you invest in this? And I'm like, well, no, first of all, I won't invest in it. I don't do that. But number two is you haven't even thought about this. So <laughs> it is very important. And then Greg, the other part that I think is really important is doing something, you know, I told you I was a salesperson. Okay. Yeah. I didn't have any skills. All I could do was talk and communicate and work. So there's no job. I mean, there's no business to be formed for the salesman to sell that to anybody. All I could do is get another job selling for somebody, selling their product. Well, my partner had yeah. a product. He knew how to run a restaurant and put it, you know, he's the chef to the business, the gravitas. He's the one that put the menu together, the concept. So that's what we had to sell. So I went into business with someone who knew the business. And then we knew each other well enough to know that we would learn how to run that business together and that we would always show up and we'd be there for the business. Because the other part about entrepreneurship is this. Everybody thinks that entrepreneurship is a way to, you know, you work for yourself. And finally, you're not working for the man. You're working for yourself. You have freedom. You can do what you want to do. The reality of being an entrepreneur is that you are working your full-time job to, to execute the business. And then you are working a second job to manage the business to which you have started. And then if you're crazy enough to get in the restaurant business, our hours and days of operation are insane. We're open all the time. So it's not like an eight to five. We have to be there at Broad Street. We have to be there at four in the morning to start baking. And we finish at one in the morning when the night bakers finish their bread. And wow. somebody has to manage that whole clock seven days a week. Wow. And at, Broad, wow. at Salamuki's, we may open at 11 for lunch, but we're there at eight in the morning because we have to start cooking. And we don't go home until midnight. Yep. It's crazy. Yeah, and I actually have 11 years in the restaurant industry myself. Uh, I actually know some of your staff over there at Bravo. You got some, you got some great workers. Thank um, you. Um, now, and before I get to some of their questions, I do, you know, as somebody in the restaurant industry myself, I think a big mistake is everybody, uh, well, not all, but uh, some restaurant entrepreneurs, they think, oh, I like to eat. This is cool. Let me open a restaurant. And it doesn't work exactly. like that. I There's make a great ham and cheese part. sandwich. I, was, I can't wait to make ham and cheese sandwiches for everybody. Yeah. yeah. And, and we have a few in here that are watching now that have worked in restaurants. Uh, but uh, it's just so many moving parts, so many business things. And uh, But you're right. It does have that business side of it, the sales. Is extremely important, but if you can't, you can sell something all day long. But if you don't have somebody that knows how to cook, exactly. If you don't have before I call you, cook. I am I am reviewing inventory and making manual price changes to our liquor and wine inventory at Salamuki, so I can get the inventory correct. Because if we don't have the inventory correct, we can't get cost of goods sold correct. If we don't have cost of goods sold correct, we don't know whether we're making money or not. Yeah, that has nothing to do with making a ham and cheese sandwich. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And, but I think that is a very common mistake of people like, oh, I, I like to cook this. Let me open a restaurant. It, I mean, that's fine, but it, it's just a lot more, uh, a lot more that goes into it. It's a lot more fun to go to a restaurant than it is to open. <laughs> I agree. I agree. It was, it was good money for me for a long time, but I'm with you on that one. Um, but here's some, I got, these are questions and these are unbelievable questions. This is uh, from Christina Robinson. She is a uh, junior and she asked, what marketing and advertising strategy do you find the most effective? So we're a local, Christina, great question. Um, we are a local business and I'm fairly well known. Uh, my partner is not interested in being in the limelight at all. So um, um, he, he has allowed me to kind of be the face to our company. Um, we have found that one of the most effective marketing tools, uh, and Greg, you said at the beginning, you said that you see, see us in the newspaper a lot, you see the things we do. We are constantly offering ourselves for service to our community. So we're the ones that show up when something needs to be done. Um, we try to be creative in the way we, um, we do our gift card sale every year. That's about to start next month. So we, we put a, uh, this is a great example of how to, how to sell, but be creative. 
Um, we will put out a, a poll uh, right around Halloween where we will ask you all to vote for your favorite charity. And the top 12 winners will become our 12 charities for the 12 days of giving. So then in November, about the second week of November, we will start a 12 day gift card sale. And every one of those charities will be featured when you buy a gift card, either online or in person, the total amount of gift cards you buy, if you buy a thousand dollars in gift cards, keep you know, just make a round number, 10% of that sale is going to go to one of those charities. And you, when you sign your receipt, you choose which one of those 12. So the idea is that we are giving, and we do that by giving them gift cards. So they have all those gift cards that they can use to feed their staff, to hold meetings, to do board meetings, to do gifting to somebody. So we don't have to pay cash, but we're giving them value. We're giving them real money to spend with us. So if they get, if there's you know thirty thousand dollars in gift cards over twelve um, days sold for this one charity, they're going to get three thousand dollars in gift cards. Now, um, I'm not paying cash for that. I'm giving gift cards, which is my product, so it's it's cheaper for me to do it. Um, those twelve charities, when they get chosen. The way they get chosen is during that, that, that nomination phase, they're telling their supporters, hey, the Bravo Broad Street Salamukis guys are doing this, vote for, it, vote for us so we can win. So then when they win, that's great, but they have to get a sale with their name on it to get the commission. So now they're telling their, their support base, buy your gift cards from Salamukis, Bravo and Broad Street. So you see how that works, Greg? I am pushing a sale for myself. Christine, I'm making money for myself by selling a gift card, which is at a discount. Buy three, get one free. It's great for you and your family. You're going to get a good deal. And 10% of it goes to charity. Everyone wins in that. That It's personality-based. It's a deal. It's local. It's, it's, a, it's a trusted brand. Those are the kind of marketing things we find that works really well, much better than you know just you know advertising in a newspaper or TV for the sake of doing it or or, you know, we do a lot of Instagram, we do a lot of, a lot of social media ads, but that's the stuff that really pays off. That's awesome. Uh, this is Jarvis Owsley. He's a junior. And he asked, what type of market research did you do before starting your business? Yeah, Jarvis, great question. So um, our Bravo business plan, I actually did two things, three things. Number one, you look at the, you look at the macro environment. The macro environment, for those that may have had some economics, that means the, the larger environment what type of food is popular in the United States in the middle 1990s? Well, Italian trattoria, in other words, Italian cafe food, and this new thing called a wood-fired pizza that Wolfgang Puck had introduced in California, that was all the rage. Well, that's what my partner was familiar with because he was in California, and we were able to bring that brand new thing to Jackson. So the idea is, and I remember having a conversation with someone that said, well, what are you going to do when when, when um, 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 Olive Garden comes to town, they'll kill you. And I'm like, totally different product, totally different concept. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, so we knew that the, the market at a global rate, the macro, this was new and coming ideas. So we weren't behind, we, this idea hadn't already jumped the shark. Secondly, at the mac, micro level, which is the local level, what is your competition? At that point in time, it was Amerigo, Mario's, um, 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 God, I don't, I, uh, from an Italian standpoint, not many choices. Uh, then we had from a, from, there's very few pizza places. Uh, and then we had, uh, you know, fine dining. You, you had, you know, uh, walkers and you had uh, 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 Shapley's and some things like that. So we, we actually did a, a, a write up on every single restaurant that was in our price range or that could be of, of, of a competitor of ours. And we wrote a paragraph about that, that restaurant. And then we compared ourselves in kind of a summary to say, we're going to, you know, this is how we're going to compete. And here's how we're going to fit in this overall structure. That's how we, we did the research ahead of time. Yeah. And especially in the area you're in, you know, now there's more competition around you and you guys are still thriving. Yes. And that, well, that's the third, thank you. The third part is location. So yeah. choosing a location that's going to have some legs. The difference between opening a restaurant and opening a regular retail store, let's say you sign a lease for five years to open up a clothing store and you might do some fancy you know, furnishings and some woodwork and paint. But the bottom line is, if you need to move the store in five years, it's mostly just your, your fixtures, you know, the furniture that moves and your, and your stuff. 
you've got some lights and some some and the air conditioning that was just the air conditions in the building to open a restaurant huge air conditioning huge plumbing gas the kitchen all the stuff that's built in it is it it, it is you know we were so lucky with sophomore spanish club slash cantina laredo where we're located cantina laredo it was a it was a three million dollar build of that building at the district and we were able to come in there and do our entire project remodeling that existing building for a half a million dollars you know wow. to, to do the whole thing wow. and open up and have a fair lease you know that we're paying the landlords if we had to pay a lease to fund a three million dollar building we wouldn't have made it maybe that was what happened to the other guys we were just quite fortunate yeah and, and people don't realize restaurants might have the highest startup cost of any business and you have to put everything in place. You have to build everything. You have to fully staff it. You have to make your first round of food before you can sell your first dollar. Exactly. If you're doing any kind of other business, you could, you know, there are people that sell, that, that, that make money by selling things online and never actually taking control of it. They have a warehouse and they will sell you a case of this, but they never have to buy it until you order it. And so they're just making money on the margin. It gets shipped to you. We have to have everything paid for before we open. Exactly. Uh, this is Michael Williams. He's a senior. And he asked, of your three restaurant concepts, which one is your favorite? Uh, you know, I, I like I have twin daughters, so I love both my children equally, but they're also very different daughters. They're very different. Um, I love all three of my work children. Um, uh, I just had lunch at Salamucas. I had a business lunch there. It was absolutely delicious. And I sat out on the patio and it was just fantastic. Um, it's got such great energy and it's an amazing place. The food is delicious. Um, I had breakfast yesterday at Broad Street uh, with someone and those cheese grits just make me so happy. I love talking to people around the coffee pot. I love the energy of the bakery. And Bravo, I spent so much of my life, I've got varicose veins because I spent so much of my time in my life walking around those concrete floors. I can walk it uh, blindfolded. Um, you know, that's my, that's my first child. You know, uh, Bravo is a pretty cool place. So I'm not going to pick a favorite. I've got, I've got, I love each of them individually. And sometimes I hate each of them for certain reasons. Uh, this is Chatez Barnett. He's a, uh, a senior. Uh, and this is, this is a great question. He said, if you were not looking for a, a place to take your girls to have ice cream, what would have been your next concept? That's a really good idea. Quite good question. We had, we had been asked by a developer to consider a location in Madison. And um, he had pitched the idea of a French restaurant. And my partner did have some competence, just a little bit, um, in, in French cuisine. And we talked about the idea of how we did Bravo with Italian, doing something like that with a French concept. And that was happening probably two years prior to us coming up with the, the Salamuki's idea. So that would have been... You know, and we actually came up with a menu. And we had a name. I forget what it is now. Azure? No. Was it Azure? Something. I don't know. Who knows? Um, 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 Lunette. That was the name of the restaurant. We came up with an idea, but that wasn't that wasn't to be. So I'm I'm thankful because I'm glad we're doing what we're doing because it's 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 extremely successful and popular. Absolutely, and it, and it is it's great food. I've been there several times. Uh, Thank you. This is from uh, Cody Myers. He's a sophomore, and he said. Of, of, and you talked about some of this, of uh, what were your most significant failures and what did you learn from them? Um, most significant failures. So Broad Street, when we first opened, we, we made a, we were still relatively new. And this was our first time to actually build out a space pretty much from scratch. It was the existing restaurant, but we moved a lot of things around. Bravo was an existing restaurant that kind of had a certain footprint. The kitchen was going to be here in the dining room. And how we made that happen was our creation, but there's certain elements we couldn't touch. This time we moved some things around. Well, we spent so much time focused on the bakery and the size of the bakery, making sure the bakery had enough room because there's so much stuff, pans, trams, rolling racks, dough boxes, you know, tables for forming dough, places you need to have things rest and to rise. You need a lot of space. We ended up with a really tiny kitchen. And we opened up and we were an incredibly successful breakfast and lunch place. People out the door. We didn't have enough room to make food. Wow. So immediately we had to remodel. Immediately, like, like within six months of opening. So within wow. six months, we closed down for, for five days and we moved the bakery out. Now we should have just added onto the building, but we didn't. 
we moved out and we moved the entire bakery to the old Cabot Lodge at Millsaps College. They had a, wow. it was, it used to be a Holiday Inn. Yeah. Holiday Inn had a full service kitchen and restaurant. The kitchen was empty. So they had this huge space. So we went in there and spent a whole bunch of money, took out a loan, just, you know, went into debt more to open, to move the bakery there. So we had enough kitchen room at the restaurant. Then we had to bake at night and move things every morning to, to Broad Street. It was a huge, huge hassle. We had all this new overhead. So then the answer to that was to go into wholesale baking. Let's start baking for hotels, other restaurants, um, country clubs. Um, so I went out and saw, I got into sales mode and I got 24 accounts lined up. Wow. Then the baker quit, the driver quit, everybody hated it. They, they tear it. So I spent a summer driving the truck. I was up every morning at 2.30 in the morning, down there at three, working with the bakers, loaded the truck up and delivered bread. Hated it. Oh my God, it was awful. We were losing money hand over fist. So we decided to stop that. And then the final decision was, well, we still have to do something to get more volume to pay for this bakery. Let's open us another Broad Street. Let's open up a small Broad Street downtown. So we opened up Broad Street Express, which was a miniature version of Broad Street. And the idea was we'd make the food at Broad Street and ship it down. We'd make the bread at the bakery and pastry, ship it down. Oh my God, it was such a failure. And so we, we lost our shirts, we lost serenity. It took us a decade to wrap that up, move the bakery back to Broad Street, close that down, another five years to pay down the debt. And, um, you know, thank God that everything is under one whole, one, one roof now, and it's a great business now, but we made so many mistakes, but wow. we kept going. We just kept going. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, this is Harmony Williams, who's a sophomore. And this is, uh, and I know you're on the news talking about this. This is a great question. She asked, how has COVID affected your business? How hasn't it affected uh, business? It's been a meat grinder. Um, so in the restaurant business, we were forced to close down a year ago, March, nationwide. There was the, the, the uh, global shutdown. Um, so I had to let everybody go. On March the 19th, I fired 182 people. It was the hardest day of my life. Um, we set everybody up for unemployment. I kept in touch with everybody. I started Venmoing money. I, started, I did a fundraiser with um, a gift card sale. I did a... a um, um, a fundraiser with a with a, uh, a produce sale from a produce company that all their produce was going bad and so we had a farmer's market and all the proceeds went to my employees i started venmoing and cash apping all them you know trying to keep in touch with them because they were no longer at work and everybody was at home and then um we were able to start uh, baking bread again to start feeding some grocery stores and then we got to go going and then curbside and neighborhood delivery finally got the dining rooms back open at partial capacity then three-fourths capacity. And finally, we, you know, we're at 100% now. Um, so it was a terrible, terrible process to go through. Now, we are busy as all get out. Y'all want to eat out. You want to eat out all the time. You want takeout. You want dine-in. You want it all. And we don't have enough employees. There's just not enough folks out there right now to work. A lot of reasons why people have left the workforce. Um, we all have been through stress with COVID. A lot of family systems have been stretched to the nth degree. Uh, parents became teachers when everybody was doing remote learning. Couldn't work and take care of your kid at the same time. You had to be at home. Um, so there's a lot of things that have kept people away from the workplace. We're struggling every day and constantly reaching out and trying to hire folks. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and that is the long tail of this is um, it is very hard to rebuild the amount of staff needed and the quality needed to be able to handle the volume. And then costs are through the roof. And y'all see this when you go fill up your tanks with gas. If you've ever gone to buy any chicken wings, congratulations. The most expensive thing in the world, and this, it's like gold, is chicken wings. And guess what the number one appetizer is at Salamuki's? Chicken wings. Um, it's, it's, so everything is expensive. And every week, we don't know what we're going to get. So from our purveyors, especially for cups and, and boxes, when you come and eat with us now, you you're not going to get a low goad cup. Those days are over. You in this week it may be plastic, and next week it may be styrofoam. Yeah, and, and we don't know what we're going to get. Paper products are harder to get than food. Yeah, yeah. So those are the effects of COVID. Yeah, and 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 uh, and, and I know that's been crazy. And you had and I'll, and I'll uh, try to go back and find you had a great they had a great piece with you on the news about that um, about you at, you advocating for the restaurant industry. And I hope, uh, hope you well, thank you. Well, there's, and so the, the, if, if the, the one thing that everyone really, I, that I can share is if it wasn't for what the federal government did 
last year with the, the what's called the PPP, the, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, and then also some other targeted stimulus for different industries. And ours, ours was, we had a law passed to give us some additional stimulus, but it wasn't fully funded. So the majority, the vast majority of restaurants in the nation weren't able to get funded. And there's effort to try to get a little more money for that. We won't know if that'll happen or not. But, but for us, if it wasn't for the um, the support that was given last year, I would be talking on the phone with you right now. I'd be out selling something. I'd be working for somebody. Our businesses would be closed. So I'm very thankful for the federal government and what they did. That's awesome. And and and, and I know uh, as part of the community, we're thankful for the work you do, uh, and you know, uh, and continue to uh, to do for the community. And you have three amazing restaurant concepts. Uh, before you. we go, just uh, uh, and we thank you so much for coming. But uh, for, before we go, uh, all these kids have come up with their own business concepts, nonprofits, hair play, you know, all, all, all across, you know, it runs the gamut. But even if uh, they never open and they, you know, and they're just okay being employed, what can they do to follow in the footsteps of a, a local person that's just as, as successful as you are? So when I was, I don't have family here. My wife's from Memphis, so we didn't know anybody. Um, she was a school teacher with Jackson Public Schools. I was working for a national computer company, but it was a very small office here in Jackson, so I didn't have a lot of coworkers. We were very much alone. And what we ended up doing is we started to volunteer um, for, um, as it turned out, Valley, Mississippi, which is, you know, it just so happened we had some friends that introduced us to that. Um, so what we started doing, it started out of, out of selfishness of wanting to go to the ballet, but not having enough money to pay for the tickets. And so if you went and handed out programs, you've got free tickets. So we did that the first year we were married. And then we met a lot of folks that were young people that were interested in supporting that art group. We, we started a young person support group. We started throwing parties, fundraisers. We made the food ourselves. We had a great time. We would, we would party down while we're making the food. And then we'd, we decorate the, 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 the mezzanine level, the Thalimara Hall downtown and have a big party. And all of a sudden we got to know a whole bunch of very, very wealthy and connected people because the kind of people that support arts groups, museums, performing arts, um, um, musical theat theatrics, these are all wealthy folks. So um, Greg, the fact that I did that volunteer work, I was asked to serve on the board for Valley Mississippi when I was 24. Oh, cool. and or 25, maybe. And when I mentioned networking to talk to the business people about how they raise money to own their rest of their businesses, guess where I knew those guys? They were the oil men and the businessmen that served on the board for Valley, Mississippi. So my advice is I was just an employee for a computer company, but I became part of the community by offering my service as a volunteer and by doing a good job of that, that volunteering, I was able to be elevated to a position where I was then in leadership in that organization and appear to people that were much, much further down the line than I ever was. And now, you know, I guess the whole thing reverses, you know, maybe I'm the old guy at the table now at the, and, you know, we're looking for the next set of young people. And any of those folks that ask those questions, outstanding questions. I mean, oh, absolutely. You know, sir, you know, so do that. And when you go to college, uh, find a way through your sorority or social group or, or just go downtown wherever you're going to school and find an organization and volunteer. And you'll meet all sorts of people and you're doing good work and it's going to be a great way to network. It's, it works out. That's awesome. And, and again, and we thank you so much for joining us today. I know you're really busy, but again, Please go see uh, Jeff Goods, all, all of his uh, his restaurants, the Bravos right there in Highland Village, the Brawl Street across the way uh, in, on 55, and the Salam Mookies there in the district, all three unbelievable places. And, and don't forget the Salam Mookies up there in Madison. We appreciate the support for that. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah and that's the one. The one and up. guys and gals, we are hiring all day long. You can go to any of the websites, Bravo, Broad Street, Salam Mookies. Contact us. Click that button. You'll see an employment tab fill out a short little, this is who I am. This is my contact info. We would be glad to give an interview. We, we are very flexible for school time, school hours. We are desperate for great people to work. Yeah, and we just had a question about the age limit for your employees. Uh, so the youngest we really hire is 16. 
uh, having a car, being 16, 15 is a little difficult. Um, there, there just tends to be a little bit of a, of a, of a cliff there. But um, during the summer, 15 works out pretty well. But during the school year, we, we pretty much find that 16 is the best age. I understand. If I, if I can help you out in any way, we got some, we got some good ones up here that I can hopefully send you. All through. you have to do is, y'all know how to Google Bravo Broad Street Sound Mickeys. I don't need to give any websites. You can find us. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Jeff, we thank you so much. You have a great day. Thank you. Good luck, guys right, and gals. Thanks. Take care.